If you're like me when I first started studying for the MCAT, I really didn't read all the passages and I dang sure didn't understand them. But today what I'm going to show you is what the MCAT was really trying to tell you with the passages and how to pull some of the clues out from them to answer some of the questions right. The strategy that we use to do this and to figure out what the passage is telling us and to, to map it out uh, it's called the flowchart method and it goes by a million different names if you go on reddit or student doctor network or you talk to your local mcat tutor um, you'll hear it called passage mapping or passage diagramming um, it really goes by a bunch of different names but what i call it is the flowchart method because as you'll see in one of my examples, it kind of looks like a flowchart. The basic premise behind the flowchart method is that the MCAT is actually going to tell you what it's going to test you on. I mean, not literally tell you, like there's no talking in the testing center and the test can't talk, but it's going to give you hints and clues as to what could potentially be on your exam. And a good test taker knows how to pick up on those hints and clues and how to really capitalize on those and use them to their advantage. Another way to look at this is I'm kind of teaching you how to cut down on some of the fluff um, because there are a lot of things on the MCAT that are in the passages that you are not supposed to have known. If you see protein NRX 69W underscore ZY, you're not supposed to know what that does. Okay, but you're supposed to be able to use the clues and the hints and the basic sciences that they give you in the passage to figure out what it does and tease out the relevant information. And the flowchart method is how I do that. Now, when it comes to mastering the flowchart method, there's really a couple steps that you need to keep in mind. The first one is you need to understand what is important in the passage, right? If you're going to pull it out, you need to understand what is important so that you know what to pay attention to. Because otherwise you're just going to get, you're just going to feel like you're getting slapped in the face by a 700 word essay because you kind of are. Those two things are basic sciences and relationships, or at least that's what I call them. Now the basic sciences is a little tricky because when it comes to basic sciences, what I mean is we are looking for any science that you remember from your MCAT prep book, and I don't care which one that is, um, or from your undergraduate classes, your core classes. Now, I know there's some of you that have taken astrophysics and dolphin biology and things like that, and we're not really worried about those, but if you remember it from general biology or biochemistry, you know, if you see enzyme or amino acid, that's a basic science, okay? That's one of the things that you wanna pay attention to are basic sciences. And the reason it's so difficult is because I expect my students and I expect you now to begin identifying those basic sciences before you've even finished reading your content book. The second thing that I'm looking for from a passage that has been shown time and time again to be tested frequently, just like basic sciences, are relationships. Now relationships can be any linkage between two things. And I know that's incredibly vague, um, but that's because it could be a direct relationship. You know, we could say hormone X causes impact Y, or it could even be saying that our new molecule is actually a neuron specific GABA inhibitor, something like that. I anything like that. If you see a link between two molecules or really two sciences, whether you're familiar with those sciences or not, that's gonna be a relationship. And I really emphasize using arrows pretty heavily and this portion of your flowchart method. Although I'm kind of an arrow slut, I look them everywhere. But that's kind of the first step, is figuring out what exactly belongs in your flowchart. It's basic sciences and relationships. And then the second step is figuring out how to place them in your flowchart. You know, how to organize this, because if it's there and it's just listed out, that may be helpful, but it wouldn't probably be quite as helpful as if you could capture the overall flow of the passage. This is where it's gonna be a little bit individualistic. Your flowchart should be easy to interpret for you. Um, my flowcharts aren't gonna look exactly like yours all the, the, all the time, but they're going to have the same contents. Now this generally works best with arrows and abbreviations because, I mean, you've gotta keep in mind, the test is timed. Right? So you can't, you can't rewrite the passage uh, or, or spend even, even really more than five or six minutes on a passage. Otherwise, you're just going to run out of time on the questions. But whatever shorthand you prefer is going to be best. Just a way to keep it concise and accurate. 
The third step to really mastering flowcharting is just becoming efficient. It's gonna take you a long time at first. I mean, I'm rewriting the way that you read. I'm rewriting, I'm telling you what to pay attention to and it's things that you normally would have skimmed over. So kind of rewriting this process and coming to a point where you are not only paying attention to these basic sciences and these relationships, but now you're writing them out and you're a little confused about the reason why and the purpose. Um, it's gonna take you a little bit longer at first. So expect to see um, some negative performance outcomes at the beginning, but that's because we're laying down a foundation to really build upon. Because most students make the fatal mistake of thinking that their improvement is gonna come on the right side of the page, meaning the questions. At the beginning, and honestly at the very end as well, your major improvements will come from the left side of the page, meaning the passage. So now that you've seen the steps to the flowchart method, it's really important that you kind of see it in action. And so I went ahead and I screen clipped a passage from the AAMC official guide, uh, the BB sections, passage five, I believe. So I'm gonna read it to you. And this is actually what it looks like whenever I'm reading this passage. These are the things that I pay attention to. So, um, as you can see on the right-hand side of the screen is my passage. And then on the left-hand side of the screen, I'm gonna take some notes, then, but that would typically be on scratch paper. But nevertheless, here we go. So at the beginning, it's talking about cell differentiation. Traditionally, cell differentiation and lineage commitment are thought of as robust, irreversible developmental processes. The only thing that I really remember from like a general biology course about that is cell diff. Um, no relationships there. Recently, however, it has been shown that fibroblasts can be reprogrammed to a pluripotent state with a combination of transcription factors. That right there is a pretty big relationship. It's a link between fibroblasts and this pluripotent state. And the link is transcription factors. So I'm going to go ahead and write that down because it, uh, it seems like a turning point in this passage already. So I'll say fibroblasts. Be transformed into pluripotent cells using transcription factors. These results have caused scientists to question whether specific transcription factors could induce other defined somatic cell fates and not just an undifferentiated state. Okay, that's actually a pretty interesting science. So it's this idea of, um, this is a little side science lesson, but essentially differentiation states are totipotent, pluripotent, multipotent, and then you become fully differentiated. So you can become a somatic cell of any kind. You can be a toenail or a taste bud. Um, and what they're essentially saying, fiberglass down here, is generally we only go downstream. However, they have found that we have the ability to go upstream using transcription factors, and that's unique. So we can take this defined cell, use a transcription factor, and make it pluripotent again. And what they're curious about, this hypothesis that they just laid out for us right here on the last sentence, is whether or not we can actually take a specific transcription factor and come back down to a different cell. So can we take a fibroblast and make it into a neuron? Very similar to, could we take a toenail and make it into a taste bud? I'm just not quite as dramatic. The scientists set out to test whether neurolinear specific transcription factors could convert embryonic fibroblasts from tau EGFP mice. You see how this is just a big long run on sentence. You're, you're going to have to break it up. And so the commas are excellent breaks. So make sure once you get to a comma, if you're in the center of a giant sentence like this, take the time to say, do I actually understand what the heck we're talking about already? Um, and so here they're really just taking transcription factors from neurons and converting this fibroblast, converting them into what? Into neurons. Okay, so that kind of skipped the inside part where they're just describing what green fluorescent protein is. Okay, so can we take fibroblasts from tau EGFP mice and can we use these transcription factors that are neuron specific and can we turn them into a neuron. That's a huge relationship. Figure one. I, I, I we'll jump in. We'll jump into figures a little bit later, um, but for the most part, they usually get skipped or, or briefly glanced over. It says twelve days after infection, scientists observed the presence of cells that displayed bright green fluorescence and were positive for two H1. Okay, so twelve days after we use this 
transcription factor. We get some cells. Um, they are positive for GFP, which means they are from this, um, this lineage. Right? That should kind of be your basic science there, which reminds me, I forgot to list it. And they're also positive for Tuj1. Tuj1. So what is Tuj1? Because I don't remember that from my, from my undergraduate course. It actually tells you. Tuj1 is a neuron-specific class 3 beta tubulin. Okay, so something that's really, really important and helpful on the MCAT. And this gets into a strategy that's a little bit more advanced that I call foreshadowing. But I'm going to go ahead and introduce it now because this passage is so good for it. Anytime that the MCAT introduces something new, like a new science, like Tuj1, then they give you a big fat comma, and then they give you an explanation of what that new science is, it is very likely that you're going to get asked a question that essentially says, what is this new science, or how is it applied, or how is it helpful in our experiment? And the only way for you to get that right is if you spend your time focusing on these basic sciences. That's what they're really asking. They're not hoping that you memorize Tuj1 from some obscure book or something like that. They just want to know, can you answer based off of the basic sciences? Okay, so that's what we write down in our flowchart then. So Tuj1, the basic sciences here, is that Tuj1 is neuron specific. I, you probably remember tubulin from some of your classes. It's a protein, um, but that would be as far as I would go. So I would say it's neuron specific protein. That's as far as I would go. Okay, these cells also express several neuron specific proteins, including new N. So they're doing it again. New N, which binds DNA. So I'm gonna say new N. And then I'll use my abbreviation for binds DNA. That's how I've always done it. I don't know why, but that's how I do it. Tests revealed that while the majority of the fluorescent cells produce the excitatory neurotransmitter GABA, and then they give you the structure, which is weird in and of itself. Um, it's another example of foreshadowing. A few produce the inhibitory neurotransmitter GABA. So some produce excitatory glutamate, sorry, and some produce inhibitory GABA. Okay, so we've got GABA being produced, which is inhibitory, and then glutamate, which is excitatory. And then we actually get their structures, which generally tells you you're going to get asked a question based on their structure. Um, but we'll see if they ask us those on this passage. It says a few, er, it says much like neurons from the central nervous system. Okay, it does not say that these behave, that these are neurons from the central nervous system. It just says that they are cranking out glutamate and GABA, and neurons from the central nervous system also crank out glutamate and GABA. Okay, don't make too much of that relationship. These cells are not equal to CNS cells. They just make certain neurotransmitters like CNS cells. <laughs> but the CNS is a basic science, so I'll go ahead and write that down. So moving on, it says in subsequent experiments, the scientists examined how each of the five transcription factors affected the production of two to one positive cells by removing a single factor from the original five factor pool. So here they're just kind of describing their approach to um, gathering these results to what the experiment really is. Um, and then it tells us that the results are shown in figure two. And so um, we have a strategy called figure interpretation that I'll dive into a little bit later that will help us with you know, figuring out what you actually need to do as far as interpreting this weird picture. It looks like Charmander's getting sliced up or something. Kind of made my eight-year-old heart cry. Or how to interpret this, this graph that's got a bunch of things that I've never heard on it. Um, and so we'll dive into that a little bit later, but for the purposes of the flowchart method, this right here is all that you would need to know to get the questions correct on the MCAT. So if you know this, and then you know your required basic sciences, you really shouldn't be too worried about this passage on the MCAT. So just to summarize, these are gonna be your basic sciences. The rest of this is going to be your relationships. So take some time to make sure that you understand um, the difference between the basic sciences and the relationships because this strategy is one that is going to build and build and build. So that's the flowchart method. I'll show you some of the questions that came along with that passage and you tell me whether or not you think it helped.
Make sure to like this video, comment on it, share it, subscribe to the channel. And if you have any passages that you want to see flow charted out, go ahead and comment on below.